that you enjoyed the first day of Doors Clock. My name is Dobrica Pavlinšić, and today I will talk about, to you about how you can take the old Android device and port the latest software on it. Over there is my prop for this presentation, which sa tries to prove that it's really possible. So the question is, is it possible to take the old Android device, in this case, very old Android device, and run latest Linux on it? In my case, I wanted to make something which would be comparable to Raspberry Pi, which basically for me means that I could run Debian on it. So what is our device? Our device is Tegra tablet. Uh, from 2011, which is actually quite a high-end tablet for that age. It has two cores with one gigabyte. It has 40, 64 gigabytes of eMMC storage. If you remember in 2011, that's huge amount of storage. It has quite nice display and uh, Wi-Fi, GPS, and stuff like that. Uh, the things which were available from the manufacturer is a really old 2636 kernel, fortunately available in source code, which is very helpful, with uh, quite a lot of changes. Uh, there was also schematic available from the OEM manufacturer, which actually produced that laptop for Lenovo, uh, which was quite fortunate, but not as useful as you might think. So if you can't find the schematic for your Android tablet or device, don't, don't despair, it's not obligatory. Uh, there is quite good Tegra support uh, in the mainline kernel, and as we'll see, there is also separately developed driver which supports both 2D and 3D acceleration, as you can see at my prop over there and they were available really cheaply locally. Basically, I bought it at Njushkalo, which is our local second-hand resell kind of site. So what is the first step if you want to do something like that? Uh, my suggestion is to try to find the serial port on your device. It will be really, really helpful when you try to do that because first thing you want to do is get some kind of feedback from your tablet. In my case, uh, as we will see, the screen didn't work. So the serial port was really invaluable to see whether I'm actually doing something or not. In this uh, case, I had a schematic. So I knew that there is a four pin port somewhere on the tablet on which is serial port. I also, from the schematic, knew that this serial port is connected directly to the Tegra processor, which in my case meant that this serial port is 1.8 volts, which means that you don't want to connect it to 3.3 volt device, although Tegra CPUs might be 3.3 volt tolerable, but I don't know, you don't want to try that as on your device. Uh, but there is a uh, 1.8 volt serial cable available from China, uh, which are basically often, often dubbed uh, iPhone cables because it used the same voltage, but it's just the serial at 1.8 volts. Uh, why, why do I have the picture of the serial port? Because uh, in this case, this was not the only unpopulated connector of the, on the board with four pins. So learn from my mistakes and don't try every possible connector until you find the right one. It took me quite, quite some time to figure out that maybe it's under the shield, and it really was. The other thing which you want to have some ability to do, and you almost always have, basically you always have it, is to be able to run your own code on the device. Uh, why do you always have that on the Android devices? Because when manufacturers create the device, you should, they should be able somehow to load the initial firmware on it. 
So if you have any ARM device, either all winner, rock chip, Tegra, or anything, there is a way to actually load your own code on it. So that's not the showstopper. Tegra is somewhat specific because there is ability to lock Tegra bootloader so you can't load the, the non-authorized software on it. But this was not the case in this case. In Tegra, it's called APX mode. You can enter it using two keyboard presses. And uh, with uh, Tegra RCM from GitHub, you can actually create the binary file which you can send to your tablet and make it do something. This also, this ability to, to load something on the device which is at that point unmodified enables you to actually experiment safely because you can always put something, try if it works and you didn't actually change the device itself. Although this tablet was so unusable because it had so old under it that market didn't support, support it so it wasn't so, so essential. But uh, you know, if this is your only device you probably don't want to break it in your first experiment. But just, just have in mind that you won't break your device. It's always possible to recover it, whatever the device is. So, so far what we have? We have working 2.6 kernel with all the changes needed to actually make this tablet work, which isn't really very useful, but it's nice because we can see what, what did they changed to make this tablet work. I had a serial port and I had the ability to run my own code. So what is the first step? The first step is to have the, some kind of bootloader which will load our Linux kernel. On ARM devices, this is U-boot. And uh, since this tablet is actually based on Ventana reference design from NVIDIA, which you can actually figure out by looking at 2.6 kernel, it was really simple to try uh, to compile U-boot, try it out with APX, and it worked. Few steps later, I also looked, uh, I, I got the serial output out of the bootloader, which was the good first step, but the display was completely blank. So what did I do? I took the diff from the 2.6 kernel and looked what did they modify to make the display work. I ported that and I got even display in U-boot. Hmm, victory. I said port changes. It might seem extremely complicated or hard, but basically that's it. On the left side, you see the changes which original developers made for 2.6 kernel, and on the right side, you can see the changes which I made in U-boot to make it work. Basically, it's you compare the names of the variables, you change the few ones, and it works. Once I had the U-boot, the next step was actually to compile the kernel and make it work. As I mentioned earlier, there is the great driver project which basically supports 2D and 3D acceleration on Tegra devices. So I actually started with it because I wanted to 2D and 3D and video decoding. Uh, I started in the same way. I looked at 2.6 kernel, tried to port the display, uh, it, it should be possible to define the display in device tree itself. For some reason, it didn't work for me, so this was like few, few lines of diff in kernel itself. But other than that, uh, all, all the other things were basically device tree configuration. I had to configure the, key, the buttons on the laptop to, to generate keyboard events, and uh, from 2.6 kernel, it wasn't clear whether the button is was pull up or pull down, but you try one, you try the other, and if you make a mistake, if you said that button is pull down and it's pull up, the thing which will happen is that when you press the button, it won't, it won't release. So you will figure it out. Basically, some buttons are pull up, some buttons are pull down. You just experiment a little and it will work out. <coughs> Then I added a few additional modules which were supported in upstream kernel already, like a temperature sensor compass, and there is also in tablet accelerometer, which is, which 
should be supported by the kernel model, but currently doesn't work. More work in progress. But all in all, this diff stat at the bottom of the slide are all the changes which were required to make this tablet over there, which actually started screensaver, working on the latest kernel. So not really so hard at all, right? As a next step, and uh, probably the most important thing which I learned during this process is actually that you want to develop using NFS root. You don't actually want to experiment on the device itself because it's so convenient to actually edit files in VI on your NFS server, which in my case is just an ordinary laptop, instead of editing it on the device itself, especially if the device itself doesn't have the keyboard. Right now I do have the keyboard. But uh, when I started, I didn't have any device, and it's, you know, it's really much more pleasurable to do that on, on your normal development machine. Uh, NFS will also enable you to, uh, to try different devices, but the prerequisite for that is actually to have the USB Ethernet device, which is supported by UBoot. Unfortunately, UBoot supports very few USB Ethernet dongles, so you will have to find the one which is supported or port changes from some other USB dongle, which is also not that hard, but it wasn't needed because I actually had a dongle which is supported. Uh, the second interesting thing I learned here is the one marked here in yellow, which is that the kernel, the kernel configuration, because you, you say to you boot, okay, please use the DHCP, acquire MAC address, and then load the kernel and init from the from the server. And once you start the kernel, the kernel also has the option to acquire address over DHCP, but unfortunately that didn't work. Uh, I suspect that it's a problem uh, with initialization of the USB interface in kernel. So the interface is not initialized correctly or something, but you can always hard code the IP address and that worked. If you want more info about uh, making UBoot work with NFS root and configuration of DNS mask, the last link here is actually the wiki page in which you can find more information. And then I had the tablet which was somewhat working, but the problem was that I couldn't charge it. Uh, since this tablet is from 2011, you would expect that the battery is quite dead, and it really is quite dead. But it's really annoying that you can actually work several hours on your tablet, and then you have to take another device which was charging during that time. So I wanted to somehow make it work during, to make it work always, to have it always powered and to be able to charge it uh, from the USB. <clears throat> the problem is that this particular tablet is very sensitive to the five volt rail. And if you don't have stable five volt, five volt rail, it will try to, uh, to pull as much as two amps if the battery is totally flat. And if the voltage drops a little bit between five volts, it will just give up and say, okay, I won't charge. So the tablet was charging quite nice when powered off, but didn't charge with power on. So what could I do other than draw nice graphs which show my problems? Well, I can look at 2.6 kernel and see what did I do to actually make it work? Uh, this tablet is also somewhat speci specific uh, in regards to other Android tablets because it's, it has another processor, which is 8051 core, which basically talks with battery. So I don't have direct connection with the, with the battery controller, but I have it through the firmware in that microcontroller, which is connected to the, to the Tegra device using I2C. This was, in one sense, annoying because 
if I could directly drive the battery charger, it would be much easier. But on the other hand, that meant that the solution was rather simple. I just had to set, to send one I2C command, copied from the 2.6 kernel, and the tablet would start charging. Win, win, win. And as you can see on the demo, uh, after recompiling the whole GL stack, including libdirm, MESA, and open Tegra video driver, I actually have X11 running on it without any problems whatsoever. So what works and what doesn't? From the I2C devices on the left, which are basically the list of the devices from the 2.6 kernel, we can see that audio, charging, compass, power, and temperature are working as is. The things which are denoted by the small hand are actually the things which I had to do something. Uh, unfortunately, the cameras are not supported, but you know, they are lousy cameras from 2011, and this tablet is still better than Raspberry Pi. Uh, display works, HDMI probably works, I didn't really test it. Uh, the, the main drawback is that the touch screen on this, this device is the SPI device, which currently doesn't work for me. The SPI doesn't work at all. Uh, keys were really easy. Those were the keys connected to GPIO, just a little bit of, de of device three. Uh, the vibrator, there is a small vibrating motor in the tablet. It actually doesn't work for me. I, I really don't know why. There is nothing special in, in 2.6 kernel for it. But if I toggle the pin, nothing happens. And it does work in 2.6, so more work needs to be done. There is also the proximity sensor, which works also one simple GPIO. There is the Wi-Fi and the 3G modem, which works because it's the simple USB device. Uh, there is the internal flash connected to MMSC, which also works, and the SD card. I think that the SD card actually works, but it's a big SD card, so I just didn't have any handy to test it. <laughs> yeah, sure, but with 64 gigabytes of, of EMMC, which has 40 megabytes of transfer rate, why would I even try the SD card, right? So was it worth it? For me, it surely is. If the, if the goal was to be able to type up the up to update, I think I have achieved that goal. So if you have more devices, you can spend one, one of them to, to actually figure out what is, what is on the board. And this is one of the tablets disassembled into, into separate pieces, still working. As you can see, it has the lead on, <laughs> on it, it works. But there are also few things left to do. For a start, the SPI controller doesn't work, which is quite strange. I think I configured everything, but surely there is a problem between me and, and the code I wrote. <coughs> the, in, in mainstream kernel, there is similar driver for the touchpad, which is used in Surface, Microsoft Surface Free. But uh, that driver actually used uh, ACPI tables to initialize. And on the ARM devices, we would need device three to do that. And I actually wrote the code, which actually queries the device three. But basically, it's really simple. You just, you just add a few defines in kernel module, and it will also query the device three. But since the SPI doesn't work for me, currently, unfortunately, touch as, as of today, doesn't still work. Uh, embedded controller will need a little bit more work and it's actually more essential because I would really like to be able to plug in the power and to battery, for battery to start charging immediately as opposed to me starting a shell script. But, you know, for now it actually works. And cameras are, are supported. Uh, the problem with cameras, it should be really easy. Uh, from the perspective of the kernel driver developer, the cameras are 
relatively simple I2C devices because you just have to set up the camera. The cameras are CSI and they will start streaming frames to memory of Tegra. Tegra hardware support will decode that in memory and all should be golden. But the, the video for Linux 2 API uh, in kernel is currently changing. So all the examples for the camera similars to mine are actually examples for the old way of doing things as opposed to new one. So this is somewhat something which I have to do at some later date. Still, still real Linux distribution on this device is much more useful than obsolete Androids. And if you enjoy this, or you have some Tegra 2 device, you can find additional notes here. On the other hand, if you don't have Tegra device, but some other Android tablet on which you want to do something like this, you can try some of the following links. If you have uh, all winner or rock chip device, I suggest to take a look at the Armbian, which is probably the most well-known and best ARM-based Linux distro for the devices. If you have the OMAP-based device, which is basically the Nexus 7 or older Nexus phones, there is a talk from FOSDEM which goes into more details what you can do. They are also quite well supported into, in mainstream kernel. And uh, the last alternative is post-market OS, which goal is to bring longer life to old devices. So in a sense, similar goal to mine. It's based on Alpine, which is basically why I didn't use that. Uh, but it does have the support for Samsung Galaxy Tab 10, which is also Tegra device. And this source, co this source code for this device actually got me the courage to actually try this because I could see all the changes between mainline and support needed for one Tegra device, which wasn't supported before. And I said, well, this doesn't seem so hard. It wasn't, it wasn't useful for any practical, practical, uh, I didn't copy any code. I, the tablets are different enough that it wasn't directly reusable, but it gave me the, care to c the courage to actually try it out. So hopefully this will motivate you to revive some of your old Android devices. Do you have any questions? Well, what about Integra Uh this, this same great driver supports Tegra 3. The Tegra 2 and newer. So Tegra 3 is also supported. Although depending on which Tegra you have uh, these days, they usually have a locked bootloader. But, but um, if, you, if you can update Android on your Tegra device, there is a possibility to actually replace the Android uh, kernel with a kernel which has k-exec, as opposed to using u-boot to boot the kernel. You actually install your own kernel which is some version which is supported on your device, and you then you can do the K exec to the current kernel. So it's also possible. I actually do have, I, I actually got a new friend from Germany uh, during this project because I started documenting everything on the wiki as I was working, and he contacted me and said, oh, I have the Tegra tablet also for two years. I'm so happy I found you. And he actually sent me the keyboard this is why I now have the keyboard and didn't have it. And this one is locked, so I will try that, that k-exec k -exec, uh, trick in the future and document it on the wiki. So this might be helpful also. Any other questions? How much was the budget? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was between 100 between 80 and 100 kunas, depending on the, on the state of this repair, which is for the international audience between 11, 12 euros and like 14, right? So they were really cheap. I have a bunch of them. 